This is a reading from the book of Azariah, third Sunday after Easter. It was written May 12, 1946. Azariah says, It would indeed be proper for the whole earth to sing praise to the Lord with an exultant voice. But if, with the faculties granted them, the lowest of the earth do so, for simply to carry out what one was created for is also to sing the praises of God the Creator, the King of the earth, man, the king of the animal creatures, master and exploiter of the animal, vegetable, aqueous, and mineral realms, is incapable of doing so. Not with order, not with love. Order, through animal nature, which puts him on a level with all the species created with matter, leaving him the first place on the scale of those living on earth. Love, through the spiritual nature with which God has endowed him, to make him similar to himself. This ring, joining the materiality of the brutes and the spirituality of the angels, this being for whom God has reserved an immortal life as what is participation in God, one for whom he has created a kingdom of eternal blessedness, cannot perish in nothingness. Man violates order, all order. He therefore violates love as well. For disorder is hatred, leading to works harmful to one's brothers and negligent towards God. Whoever harms his brothers, using the realms in which man is the king and exploiter to do harm, whoever does harm to his brothers, using the superior intelligence with which he is endowed to cause harm, whoever believing himself to be a little god for a short time, in that time is incapable of offering God homage and obedience, shows that he contravenes order and is thus disorderly in order and demonstrates that he hates his fellows and hates God, in harming the former and offending God in a thousand ways. The liturgy recalls this duty of man as a living being on earth of loving and praising the Lord, the first among the forms of reverential love for the one worthy of all praise, a prudent act which, in reminding the intellect of the thought of God, restrains man's whole being from performing works which only those without faith can perform. But too few accept the advice, the liturgical invitation, and the earth lacks too many human voices in the chorus of creation to its creator. The most beautiful voices in the immense choir are scarce, for too many men forget that they exist because God maintains them. In the time of the psalmist, the works of creation were still acknowledged to be God's. Man now denies even these, and this being, who is unable on his own to create a single, slender, but innocent and useful stock of hay, denies God the attribute of Creator, frequently substitutes heavy, obscure matter in place of God, the luminous and repeating the accursed phrase, like you, I am, the phrase of the rebel, succeeds in being the creator of death and to pain, taking from the things created by God, which were good, the elements to create what is not good, what is torment and estrangement. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. As in the psalmist's day, however, while with their works and their thought they go against God, against order, against peace, and against everything, it is clear that they also go against sincerity and, out of hypocrisy, calculation, and baseness, adulate God with false utilitarian celebrations aimed at deceiving other men and fit for offending God more than any honest absence from worship. O oh, hypocrites who always say, God, God, while exclaiming, I, I, in your hearts, your works cover the earth, but with what? With ruins, pain, death. The sublime terribleness of God has given good things in his terrible power according to the ancient mode of expressing the grandiosity or perfection of a power. He has given them in his infinite power according to the proper expression of recognition of God. And these works, terrible in power, made by God, had covered creation with things, beings, elements, aids, natural laws and supernatural laws providing upbuilding, contentment, and life. This is man without God, for he is without charity towards either God or his brothers, doing his works, truly terrible in the current sense of the word, frightful, cruel, which destroy what God has made, trample on every right and every duty, deride every natural and supernatural law, annul love, and cause ruin, pain, and death. Can man check this avalanche of the godless? He can individually, by not cooperating with it that is, by leading a truly Christian life of order, justice, and love. And God helps these willing ones by giving them all the means to live with order, justice, and love. He gives them grace through the merits of Christ, sustains them with the sacraments, amplifies the faith 
with the proofs of truth and the love of God, and from man's birth to his death he does nothing but continue these aids, and others still, all of them supernatural, among which not the least is the angelic ministry to make man arrive at death in grace and peace, so as to receive eternal glory. He can do so collectively by joining his other brothers with benevolent brotherhood, a Christian society against an anti-Christian society, a family of children faithful to the Father against a family of degenerate children who have abandoned the Father of lights, John chapter 1, verse 17, to choose the Father of darkness as their father. But man is so weak that his will does not suffice to offer resistance to the force of evil, that in a thousand forms scours the world and corrupts it, and corrupts souls, either definitively or by snatches, with sudden assault. Man by himself cannot withstand Satan, for Satan is one self, and the flesh, and the world. And then let us angels play, pray, along with you, good men, asking the Almighty, who has given the erring what they need to get back on the ways of justice, to grant those who are already on this path, but who might be wrenched away from it by some trap or some bending of their will, what they need to have the strength to reject all that is contrary to the Christian life, and to practice what is in conformity with it, with fortitude and constancy until the end. That is, let us ask that God grant his aid with the help of the Lord. The weak become strong, the fearful heroic, the sensual temperate, and justice is reached, and people maintain themselves and live therein. For even if one falls through a violent assault, through a momentary spiritual somnolence, we see that with the help of God, he quickly gets up again and proceeds towards the goal, heaven. And now let us meditate on the teachings of Peter, who can speak as a master, both because of his human experience and because he was instructed by the word and enlightened by the spirit paraclete, so that he could be the perpetual teacher of the apostolic church. Simon of Jonah of Capernaum, Chephas of our Lord Jesus, can speak to men as a man who wanted and was able to become an apostle, and as an apostle upon whom the Pentecostal flame descended to consecrate him to the perfect teaching. Have you ever meditated, O soul of mine, on the symbol of that tongue of fire, which, you have seen it, rested upon each of the apostles' heads while it crowned the all-holy woman with a wreath? I want you to have, I want to have you comprehend it. You are generally told, in the form of a flame, to be perceptible to the apostles and to signify love and light. Yes, that too, but not that alone. The paraclete could have, and it would have sufficed, come in the great rush of wind and penetrated into the cenacle, where the Eucharistic rite had already been fulfilled. Acts chapter 2, verse 2. The donation of the God made flesh to his faithful, so that he would be in them even after the separation, and they would not be deserted by their beloved master. He would have penetrated and remained a globe of marvelous he could have penetrated and remained a globe of marvelous splendor to enlighten the minds which had to speak to the world of the true God and of his Christ. But the Paraclete did not live, limit himself to that. He too, like the incarnate word, broke and gave himself in a communion, in an outpouring and donation of his gifts of wisdom, intelligence, counsel, science, fortitude, piety, and fear of God, just as Jesus had him given himself in body and blood, soul and divinity. And since, notwithstanding the sanguinary, most la holy lavacre in the blood of the Lamb, which had cleansed their souls, but had not destroyed their humanity, which had to struggle on its own and evolve towards perfect spirituality, that humanity remained, even after the resurrection, heavy and dull, ineffable love, the Creator, together with the Father and the Son, for the union and will of the three who love one another divinely, are inseparable, wanted to create the new apostolic man, when the Father, in due course, <clears throat> had already created him for life, and the Son of Grace, and the Son for Grace. The paraclete, acting upon these two creatures, these two creations, wanted to complete and perfect them, burning up the heaviness, the heaviest, the most poisonous dross remaining in the humanity of the apostolic man, located in the head, where the five senses are joined together at the service of material sensuality, where the organ is enclosed, presiding over the sensations and transmitting them to the most remote organs, and where the agent of thought is, the head, the apex of man, the only animal that stands erect, almost as if to testify to his regality, and who, on account of his erectness, seems to symbolize the fact that, as the sun reigns longer on summits, and the bolts of natural electricity descend so he, the summit of creation, 
gathers in upon himself the divine Son and receives the supernatural, marvelous commands and comforts of his Father who is in heaven. But into the head sometimes, and too often, informed with heavy slabs of threefold sensuality, the divine Son and the Father's messages cannot enter while the corrupt fumes of a corrupt humanity rise up. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. He, the Most Holy Master, has said, It is from the heart that evil thoughts, homicides, thefts, adulteries, fornications, false witness, envies, and blasphemies come, and they rise up like smoke from a malodorous brazier to the head, producing disturbing thoughts which are then transmitted to the executive organs. Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, and Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 22. Even if in the apostles there were not homicides, robberies, adulteries, fornications, false witness, and blasphemies, what a lesser throng of lesser shortcomings, but still unworthy of spiritual master, was in them, and might grow out of pride over being masters, and aided in an extraordinary, extraordinary way by the extraordinary gifts of God. How many fall into discredit for this reason, and how many the extraordinary gifts are a ruin it should, in truth, be said that the selection of spirits is carried out on account of sin, but it can be stated that not only by the way of darkness the lambs are separated from the goats, but also through the luminous means of the extraordinary gifts. God often pours himself out with these gifts. He seldom persists, for he is put to flight by the pride, deceit, and spiritual sensuality of the creature benefited by the extraordinary gift. In the apostles, that was not to happen. In the son of darkness, in the wretched deicide Judas, the gift of miracles had initiated the, the apostles' ruin. But in the twelve destined to evangelize the world, there were not to be any more ruins. And behold, the Spirit in his Pentecostal communion, burning and purifying the seat of sense and thought, the heads of the apostolic men, while he crowned with the love the head of the virgin, his spouse, and drew close to kiss with the only kiss worthy of the most blessed virgin mother, the one who was all grace, daughter, spouse, and Mother of Grace, Mary, Queen of the Apostles, and of the Church on earth, Queen of the Angels in Heaven. Alleluia! And now that I have explained the symbol of the breaking of the paraclete fire into so many tongues, and of their burning over the Apostles' heads, let us return to the Apostle Peter, who, having become spiritual after the communion of the Spirit, remembered that he had been a man, and with charity and knowledge and truth told and tells men who are his disciples and brothers the rules to reach the spirituality which makes them saints. He says, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, to refrain from carnal desires. Indeed, Christian man is a stranger and pilgrim in the midst of pagan throngs. The world, pagan in its customs, and humanity itself, more or less latent or more or less violent than the Christian, makes the spirit proceed as a pilgrim and stranger through countries not his own, unknown and dangerous. And we see then that Peter warns, refrain from carnal desires as being of another nation that could take you and then make you their slaves. Proceed warily, for you do not know the real visage of the things surrounding you. They may have a good appearance and be abject and an innocent appearance and be roguish. Watch yourselves. Do not make easy alliances. Have charity, but do not let what belongs to others not of your chosen lineage penetrate you. Charity, which prays and forgives and instructs by actions even more than by words, but discretion. Always remember that the spirit is more delicate than a virgin, and that if deflowered, it no longer has the lovely freshness of innocence. Forgiveness descends upon the repentant spirit, and penance makes it once again acceptable, acceptable to the Lord. But the memory remains, the memory of the fall, and memory mortifies, and may be of use to Satan to shake specters in the twilight hours which every man encounters, and especially in the hour of death, to make man fearful and distrustful of God. O oh, supreme security of a spirit unsullied by mortal sins and voluntary sins, how you should be sought after and protected. Supreme security to make man take joy in you. Be cautious then, while you are strangers and pilgrims, for your own sakes and for the honor of God. Don't you want to work for his glory? And you must thus be bent on converting the pagan slaves, pagans enslaved to sense in the world. But how can you be? If the sensual and worldly could oppose you against your words, the fact that you are like them. Be careful, then, not to provoke complaining on your account, but rather, by your authentically holy works, take care to provoke positive reflections, which prepare for the Lord's coming to the pagans of the world, who on the day of their conversion, through your merit, will glorify you as their saviors, together with the great 
and thrice holy God and Savior. And Peter says, Be subject to all authority out of consideration for God. And what of it? Does God perhaps protect certain inauspicious authorities? Oh, don't harbor that thought. But what accumulates merits upon you, your obedience to all human authority, so that it cannot be said that you are rebellious and turbulent and a scandal to others, at the same time accumulates condemnations upon anyone holding authority who uses it iniquitously. Be, su be subject, therefore. And to what point? as far as human law goes. But if a human authority should wish to penetrate into the domain of God and impose upon you laws contrary to the divine law, then be free and capable of dying, but without betraying God and his law out of fear of a man or various men. And do not do so out of calculation either, so as to gain men's favor, but with a supernatural spirit which is capable of distinguishing and to practicing good order as opposed to that which is wicked and of doing what does not prejudice the right to life, which persecutions do not destroy, for they instead lead those faithful to the holy law to life. Respect everyone. God leaves man's will free. Man does not have the right to violate his brother's will, and eternally accursed are those who by violence impose slavery on human thought to have throngs of slaves bound to their heretical, pernicious ideas. Be loyal adversaries to your, of your ideological enemies. Seek to bring them to your idea, which is holy by holiness of life rather than the eloquence of your speech, but never stoop to their system of secret accusation and violence, of contempt and calumny. Even if those leading you astray are poor brothers enveloped in heretical ideas, they are still your brothers. The Savior came and prayed and suffered and died for them as well. You must pray and suffer for their conversion in an imitation of Christ our Lord. Do not give the king or heads of state greater honor than you give God. You weep over having done so. You have mistaken a man, a wretched man. Footnote, a reference to Mussolini, according to Maria Voltorta's annotation on a typewritten copy. You weep over having done so. You have mistaken a man, a wretched man, for an envoy of God, forgetting that it is the works of men which, speaks, which speak of their belonging to God or Satan, and you are bitterly atoning for this foolish idolatry of yours. No idolatry is left without punishment. Bear this in mind. Honor the heads, then, but worship God alone, and be respectful of major dependence, that is, the citizen's dependence on his leaders, children's on their parents, and servants on masters, without rancor and envy, without dishonesty or betrayal. Learn to see God beyond man, and as you obey magistrates, relatives, or masters, who may also be such as not to attract love, look beyond them and say, Father, I serve you. I serve you by fulfilling your command, which is to be meek and obedient. Oh, you will, see, you will then see that it is easy to obey if you firmly believe that this obedience is seen and blessed by God as the greatest of the meritorious works by man, as the saint in whom Christ is so visible, your Saint Francis of Assisi, saying, says, Perfect joy does not lie in science or in different things, but in doing the will of the Father and being able to suffer afflictions and sorrows patiently out of love for God. You see, soul of mine, that the Apostle's words are echoed in those of the Seraphic Father, proclaiming it to be a grace, and a great grace, to be able, out of consideration for God, to bear troubles and suffer unjustly. For when, for when one suffers punishment for sins committed, it is only expiation, a debt which is settled, and nothing more. But when, without having committed sins, indeed having done good, it is granted you to suffer, it is a great grace which shines in the eyes of God a treasure which is accumulated to your advantage in the kingdom of heaven. And now I shall leave you, soul of mine, under the mantle of the crowned spouse of the Holy Spirit and Queen of the Apostles, and thus of the voices, of the great voices, and on account of her mission, which is perpetuated forever and ever, of all the voices who meritoriously fulfill their mission for the glory of God and salvation of souls, she is, therefore, your Queen, O voice. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.